Topic 7. Augustus Turns a Republic into an Empire So in the drama of the last topic, I should say when last we left, Mark Antony called for help from Cleopatra at the Battle of Octium, and she split. And he commits suicide, and she commits suicide. And so the only person left is, in fact, Octavian. Now, there's a question. Did Octavian win, or did they lose? I think Mark Antony and Cleopatra made some dumb decisions, especially Mark Antony's decision to adopt Caesarian and say that he was going to make Cleopatra his queen. But Octavian was smart enough, now 10 years older um, than at the beginning of this story, to exploit that to his advantage. And what he now does is he begins to turn from a republic to an empire. Not his idea. Clearly, it was Uncle Julius's idea. But he's learned from mistakes. And even Uncle Julius made some mistakes. Uncle Julius went too far. Do you remember when he changed the toga? Instead of wearing the white toga of the senators with just the purple trim, he wore purple entirely. He came a little too close to being a rex or a king. And so Augustus has got time. He's about 30, 31 years old. He, in fact, has a very long reign. He doesn't die until 14 AD. He doesn't know that, but he's planning on a long reign. The interesting thing is that you never see Augustus depicted physically as old. He controlled his image in the same way that Julius Caesar controlled his image. And there are two famous images. There's one head that was dug up in the Sudan. Um, if you want to have a lot of fun with material objects, Listen to BBC's A History of the World in 100 Objects, um, a series that they did a number of years ago, still online. And one of them is a head of Augustus. And this one particular head of Augustus isn't unique. There are copies of it all over the empire. They were just highlighting this one. But it dates from about 25 BCE, fairly early in the reign, when he's still a relatively young man. Maybe he's 35 years old. But even when he's 60 and 70, that is still the image that's floating around, along with another one where he's shown standing very buff, looking very good in a cut-away cut military um, piece of armor with his, his uh, biceps showing, um, and he's pointing his way to the future. And there's a little cherub, or kind of an angel, down at his, his knee representing the fact that he is nearly divine, pointing the way to the future. And his face is very youthful there. And so he's going to control his image. He's also going to move slowly. And so if you look at the history of his reign, he takes steps in stages. The first batch of steps is right after he is the only one left standing from about 29 to 23 BCE. Then he takes another series of steps in 18 BCE. And then in 9 CE, what ends up being a few years before his death, another step. So what he's doing is he's moving from the republic, which really wasn't functioning as a republic for over 100 years prior to that, to something called a principate. You hear the word prince. You don't hear the word king. Remember, king is a four-letter word. And so a principate, where he is a first among equals, to something that looks like a constitutional monarchy. And the key word in that phrase is not constitutional monarchy, it's that looks like a constitutional monarchy. Because what he's doing is he's turning a republic into an empire, convincing everybody that it's still a republic, but it's a republic with a strong leader, a monarch, who is bound by a constitution and limited by a senate, even though that's not the truth. So he's very clever in moving in these stages. He puts together what is a fairly efficient form of government. It's going to survive these crazy people, Caligula Nero, as we're going to see moving forward, and it continues to succeed. The further you get from Augustus, the better he looks. You see his foresight and his administrative capabilities. He's not a visionary. He's a manager, a better manager than Uncle Julius had been, but he's taking that vision and he's implementing it. In fact, at the end of his life, he dictates uh, a list of things that he did called the Res Gesti. It's a very boring title. It means the, the, the list of the things that I did.
basically. And I did this and I did that. But it's always, even though, as many of my students say, if you took the letter I out of this text, you'd read about a third less of it. It's always, I did this when asked to by the Senate. I did this to provide safety and security to the people. I am a servant of the people. And so that's how he kind of thinks about this. Now, why would people follow him? Well, this takes us back to prior topics. You don't understand Hitler without understanding the 1919 Treaty of Versailles. You don't understand why people follow Caesar without understanding Marius and Sulla and the civil wars with Pompey and Crassus. You don't understand Augustus unless you understand everything that had occurred for the last hundred years. And so he is providing safety and security. In fact, he declares peace for the first time that anyone can remember um, in over a hundred years. He declares that magistrates and soldiers should take an oath to him personally. Now pause there for a second. You might say, wait a second, that doesn't fit. If they're taking an oath to him personally, isn't that Marius and Sulla and Julius Caesar? Yes, but what he's doing is he's now saying that I embody the empire. I am the empire. So if you take an oath to me personally, he gets the loyalty of the soldiers, which worked for Marius and Sulla and then Julius Caesar. But at the same time, you're convincing people that it's not really you, it's the empire to whom they are taking an oath. And so it's the same thing as before. He is now the empire. It is what Louis XIV, to jump ahead, whoa, 1,700 years, Louis XIV will say in French, Latin, c'est moi. The state, it's me. And that is what's going on here. In fact, he doesn't take the title of Augustus. He is voted that title by the Senate. Now, obviously, he engineers that vote, but they are recognizing that he has made Rome better. Augustus, an august person, is not a word that we use nowadays, but if you look it up in a dictionary, it's still there. It doesn't mean the month, it means an august presence, somebody with charisma, somebody with auctoritas, somebody who embodies the mos maiorum. Do you remember that? The ways of the betters. He changes the Senate so that it appears to be a republic. Now, the Senate originally, I'm going back now six, seven hundred years, was a hundred people. Then 300 men, it had fluctuated between 600 and 1,000, a little too big. So he looks at the numbers and he says, let's get mm, 600. 600 is big enough so I could say, well, we're growing, and so we need more people participating. 600 is a good number. It's also big enough that the 600 will spend time arguing among themselves and not attacking him. And the people elect the senators, but he has a censorial vote. That is, he can veto anyone, or he can veto a list of applicants. So he's got his hand on it. He puts together what we would call a cabinet. It's called a concilium principis. These are the people who give the concilium, the council, principis to the prince. You hear that principate there? And it's modeled after the monarchy, at the beginning of our course, of the Comitia Coriata. Remember the Coria or the court? So it looks like he's a first among equals. He's not a king. He's taking counsel. It makes a lot of sense. The Senate had work to do. The Senate was uh, charged with the oversight of law and money, but the emperor was always having his hands on things too through this concilium principis. Augustus makes some military changes. Now he's also learning that while having soldiers loyal to you personally is good, it also can lead to trouble because soldiers can change their loyalty from one general to another. And so he professionalizes the army. Up until now, we've been talking about the citizen soldier. We've mentioned Stephen Ambrose using that phrase to talk about World War II and the greatest generation. What Augustus does is he puts senators as generals, which is something that will happen in every war in American history. The rich people buy commissions. Or it's only later that we have professional officers trained at Annapolis, the US Air Force Academy, and West Point as well. And so what is he doing? He's rewarding some of these generals. He's saying, you know, go off to war and you can have the spoils of war. But he's also getting rid of loudmouths in Rome. So anyone who's troublesome, he can make them a general. They love that. They can go off. They can do their own thing. And Augustus says, and maybe they'll be killed too in battle, which wouldn't be so bad if you're Augustus. 
He standardizes the length of service. He really makes a professional standing army, as we think of it in a modern terms. And that length of service is 20 years. So when you signed up, um, some of you would have signed up or had members of your family sign up for four years or in the Navy uh, could be only two years, what was called a kitty cruise. I think if you were 17, you could sign up for two years. When you sign up in the Roman army, it's 20 years. I mean, that's something, right? So you go in at 15 and you get out at 35, but some of you may know cops, firemen, and they usually take 20 years as a career. They don't sign up for 20 years, but maybe in their head they're thinking, I'm gonna do this for 20 years. You get a salary and then a pension at the end. And so if you go in at 20 or 25, you're still a young man or a young woman at 40 or 45. You could have a whole other career after that. So some similarities there. And these are professional soldiers. So they are now wearing uniforms. They are being trained. They can work their way up. What about the provinces? Well, let's think of the Roman Empire now. I talked earlier in this course about if you look at the Roman Empire at its height, we're not quite at its height just yet, that's going to be about another 100 years from now, but if you take the continental United States, the 48 contiguous states, and you put them on a map of Europe, that's pretty much the size of the Roman Empire at its height. Now at this point it's pretty big, so how do we organize it? So he needs to figure out what I'm going to do. And what he does smartly is he doesn't expand, right? Companies that succeed expand on a planned system, planned growth. Where do we want to be in three years, five years, ten years? The companies that fail are companies that often do spectacularly well for a year or two or three, and then they crash because the companies um, expanded too rapidly into fields and products that they knew nothing about. They got greedy and then they collapse, right? This is a story that we've heard again and again. Augustus, because he's a good conservative Roman, says, now is the time to consolidate, not quite to expand just yet, controlled growth. And I'm going to need to train civil servants. And he particularly looks at the equites. The equites, if you remember, were the upper echelon of the plebeians. And I'm going to make these people my civil administrators. So I can hold out for them that they can get up to the senatorial class. People in the provinces are going to have to pay taxes. They're getting our services. They're going to have to pay taxes. But I'm going to hold out for them the hope of citizenship. No taxation without representation resonates in the hearts and minds of Americans. So what about the people in the provinces? What if they are being taxed, but they can't be citizens? And he says, well, you can be citizens. Maybe you can't be a citizen, but your son may be able to be a citizen. And so what is he doing is he is Romanizing and enculturating Rome and the provinces. It works two ways. So Rome goes in and it brings Romanitas, Romanis, to the provinces, but at the same time, it adapts to its local circumstances and takes what's good about those other cultures and folds it back into Romanization. So you see, what's happening here is you're knitting together a tapestry, and that makes for a very strong garment, if I can belabor the image. In fact, soldiers at the end of their 20 years are encouraged to retire on site Remember, one of the problems with the returning war veterans after the Punic Wars is they all came back to Italy and they all wanted to, and they all got into arguments over land. So he says, retire on site, marry, intermarry, spread your DNA, spread Romanness there. And that happens obviously through the Latin language, which becomes the connective glue, the official language of the empire, though there were dialects. Um, spoken as well. Intermarriage becomes incredibly important and the system of cults. Remember that's not the dangerous word but religious cults. So Rome adapts to, adopts local cults into the Greco-Roman mythological system and also offers up what are called the imperial cults over time. Remember that Augustus at this point is not dumb enough to say, I am a god. Nero, he's dumb enough to do that. But he says, I am the son of a god. So he's going to set up statues of Uncle Julius, and there's Julius Caesar, and I am his adopted son. I am the son of a god, and so therefore you should follow, worship him, but follow me. And that brings some of the, um, the empire together too. And he allows local rule. Very, very smart. Well, I mean, it's very smart for a number of reasons. One is those local elites or their sons might become citizens. Those local elites 
know the people there. They speak the language, quite literally, they speak the language. They know how to farm. They know the terrain if there are enemies coming in. They know how to fight. They know how things operate. And so it makes a lot of sense to give some autonomy under imperial oversight. And the imperial oversight are these equites, these civil administrators, which initially are sent from the city of Rome. But over time, there will be a local body of these civil administrators. And now we go not from the center to the periphery, but the periphery to the center. That is, if you are born in Spain and you become a citizen, because you've worked hard, or you've worked hard and your son becomes a citizen, that bright young boy could work his way up from a local job to a regional job to a provincial job, and maybe he'll make his way to the major leagues and get to the work in the Roman Forum at headquarters in the city of Rome. The other thing that Augustus does is he says, okay, great, what do I own? Do you remember when Thomas Jefferson doubles the size of the United States of America with the Louisiana Purchase? One of the first things he does is he sends Lewis and Clark out and he says, what do I have? So he takes a census of people and property. This happened in 1066 for you medieval history fans. Remember William, Duke of Normandy, becomes William the Conqueror and then William the First, King of England. One of the first things he does is he takes a census and that census, which takes about 20 years, produces the Doomsday Book in 1086, which has nothing to do with apocalypticism in the end, the end of the world. It's a census book. And so when he gets this census of people and property, he says, well, this area is too large to administer, so I'm going to break it up into more manageable pieces. Remember, this is his genius, is being an administrator. So now how do I connect center to periphery? How do I connect periphery to center? How do I function? Why do people want Rome to come to town? Well, for a number of reasons. One thing is, one of the first things the Romans do when they come to town is they improve the roads. The roads are the original information superhighway of the ancient world. Nothing moves unless there's a road. To go in the other direction, think of the Silk Road. What would the the history of East and West be without the Silk Road. We wouldn't even know the name Marco Polo, even though that's 1,300 years into the future from where we are right now. But Rome comes using that good Etruscan technology, which it's improved on, and builds main roads, secondary roads, and tertiary roads. Once roads are built, my goods, if I'm a local person, all of a sudden have a bigger market. I can make more money. Hey, Romans, come in, build the roads. It's good for me. You know what also moves? Mail. The postal system can move back and forth. Now, business can be transacted more rapidly. Coins can go back and forth. And, you know, armies can go back and forth too. So we want to make sure that we're going to stay in line because we know that not only can the emperor send an army down that road, but he's setting up camps of soldiers in situ as well to make sure that I don't rise up. So, you know, there's a cliche here that the Romans are coming, the Romans are coming, and everybody heads to the hills. There are lots of examples of people saying, hey, Romans, come over here, because now my roads have been improved, my economy can be improved, I'm going to get the equivalent of police and fire protection. Not quite what we think of nowadays, but it's certainly not in the interests of the Roman administrators to have lots of crime and to have buildings that burn down. So this, these little provincial cities and towns are going to be broken up into districts and there's going to be ways of, you know, if there's a fire in this district, there'll be a certain signal and certain people, volunteer firemen essentially, will be in charge of taking care of that, um, of that uh, district. So police and fire better law and order. I'm now safer. My kids are safer. My daughter is safer. Of course I want that to come in. And aqueducts. They didn't know microbes. They didn't know germs. But they did know that if I bury people in my backyard, there's going to be disease. If I have lots of garbage in my front yard, there's going to be disease. And if the water's dirty, people get sick. They don't know, didn't know why. They didn't know how. But they did know that there was a direct correlation between clean water and better health. Better health, good nutrition, longer lives, everybody wins. 
How do we get clean water in? And how do we get human refuse out? That's a big, big uh, improvement over my life. Now, that's not to say that there aren't going to be revolts. That's not to say that, you know, because basically the Romans are coming in, right? So here come the Romans down the road. Hi, we're the Romans. We're coming. Well, whether you want them to come or not, they're coming. So resisting is a dumb idea. Now, let's remember that Rome comes in and Rome says, hey, we're going to give you all of these things. And you say, great, my life improves. Because if you resist, Rome is still coming. And your life is not going to improve if you resist. You're still going to be the junior partner, but here's the genius of Augustus. He says, you're going to be the junior partner, no question. We're Rome, you're not, no question. But we're going to make you as Roman as you can possibly be out here. In fact, over time, you can be as Roman as you would be if you were sitting right in the middle of the Roman Forum. You can be part of this big, greater thing. Although, let's be honest, always in the background is the threat that we will crush you like a bug in a split second. So that's the situation. Everybody knows what it is. Back home in the city of Rome, there are a few more social reforms. So remember, we're still talking about our topic is how does he turn a republic into an empire. All of these years of civil war have led to the deaths of young men on a very large scale. And I want to go to World War I for a moment. I think we have all read or seen All Quiet on the Western Front or other movies, Stanley Kubrick's Paths of Glory, that talk about life in the trenches. Gallipoli, another example of a movie, where the British would recruit from one little town in Wales, let's say, and they took all of the military eligible men, so all of the men from 18 to maybe 35, and they put them in one division. Now those people end up in Europe, somebody blows a whistle, they come up out of the trenches, and they go into the no man's land where they are mowed down. Now this would have happened in Germany and France as well, but just to use a British example. Now, in the space of several minutes, I have wiped out all of the men, the potential fathers in that town. Not only have I destroyed the lives of the men running in that no man's land, but I have destroyed the lives of the women back home. And this is why, after World War I, one of the reasons why governments, when they're putting together military units, mix people up. And this is why, in World War II, one of the interesting things, if you've seen movies like Biloxi Blues, where you know, a boy from Brooklyn meets somebody from Alabama for the first time in boot camp. And that actually was a way of making Americans think of themselves more as Americans and less as, you know, I'm a Southerner or I'm somebody from the, South, from the Southwest. So because of this civil war, you have massive numbers of young men who were killed. So now, what do you have in your population? You have young men and older women, that is postmenopausal women. So the young men are going to be wooing these women, but there's no chance that these women will have children. The young men become legacy hunters, and so you have all sorts of inheritance problems and depopulation because of civil wars. So what does he do? He increases the incentives to have children. He gives tax credits for children. I think a lot of us, when we fill out our taxes, like our children for all sorts of reasons. Not the least is on April 15th, they become a nice little tax deduction. Now, that's not why you have kids, is it? But in the Roman Empire, yes, it was an incentive because you got massive tax credits for having children. Bachelors were taxed at a higher rate, an incentive to get married. Adulterers were fined. They didn't care about the moral issue. They cared about inheritance issues because adulterers might produce illegitimate children. Illegitimate children cause inheritance problems. In fact, there was a law of three children. Remember we talked about women not really having a voice, but they had more of a voice in Roman society than in Greek society? How about this? If a woman had three children who survived infancy, and in this period of time, actually through the Middle Ages, the word infantia took you through the, your 10th year. All of those things that now our children get inoculated against, 
measles, mumps, rubella. Now polio, they get shots when they're two or three and they cry, but they don't have to worry about these things anymore. All of those childhood diseases wiped kids out at a huge rate. So infancia, infancy, took you to 10. If you lived to 10, you likely would live to 50 or 60. So a woman who had three children who survived infancy got the right to sign contracts. That's a big incentive, and he eliminated class barriers to marriage. So he takes the notion of pater familias, and he says, I am the pater patriae, I am the father of my country now in empire.